I was having so much fun talking with people. Good to see you all. Do you know what today is? Sunday. Sunday. Yes. And it's actually the first day of Advent, which is, um, I don't know where the year went, but here we are, the first Sunday of Advent. And so I thought I would begin the announcements with, uh, with one of the Advent readings um, that often gets neglected. It's a, part of the, it's a part of Isaiah's readings, and this is one of the forgotten ones, and I'd like to start uh, uh, the announcements uh, this morning by reading this because it's really, I find it so up uplifting. In that day you will sing. I will praise you, O Lord. You were angry with me, but not anymore. Now you comfort me. See, God has come to save us. I will trust in him and not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and he will give me victory. With joy, you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. In that wonderful day, you will sing, thank the Lord, praise his name, tell the nations what he has done. Let them know how mighty he is. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praise around the world. Let all the people of Zion shout his praise with joy. For great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have just a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, the, the youth uh, group Christmas card service is now taking place. You'll find the box uh, in the back where you can where you can drop your Christmas cards for members of the congregation, and the youth will see that they're put in the right in the right slots. Uh, Christmas, there's been a little bit of discussion about whether or not we would have Christmas Eve service this year because of COVID. Um, and, uh, uh, and we've decided that, yeah, we're going to go ahead uh, and have a Christmas Eve service. Uh, and, uh, but we're going we're gonna to sort of scale the service down. We won't have all of the buttons and whistles that we have had in a more traditional uh, Christmas Eve tradition here. Uh, but we think, it's, uh, we, we think we have a wonderful service plan and welcome you to that one. And then finally that announcement above that's the greatest of all announcements, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
Get the band back together. Get the symphony. Get the children's choir. Get the high school marching band. And the dancers. Don't forget the dancers. We're gonna play a new song. All of us. Everyone. This will be God's song. It's part of him and it's been given to us. And we will sing it from the tallest buildings. It will be the greatest song of all. We will sing it when we are low. We will sing it when we are on a mountain. It is a song of the universe. From its beginning to the present moment. Now, this moment. And it will go on forever because God goes on forever. This is God's song. God the creator, God the good, God the just, God who brushes his opposers off like dust from his shoulders, God the mighty and God the merciful. People will sing this song, people will dance to this song, no critics allowed. They will be stopped dead in their tracks. Their words will be turned against them because today, today we will sing. Today the baby is born. Today the angels break forth. Today darkness cowers in the corner. Today wrongs are righted. Prophecies are fulfilled. Wounds are healed. The hungry stomachs are filled. Today we all get adopted. Today Jesus comes to earth. Yes, Jesus, the Messiah. And this is the song we sing. This song will heal the world. This song is the song of our Savior. He is born. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is born. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can join our voices together with the angels who sang glory to God in the highest, who announced this new song that people all over the world would be able to sing because of the birth of Jesus. He came to bring life <clears throat> that is abundant. He came to touch our hearts, to mend broken hearts. He came to bring life that is abundant, to share truth that will set us free. He came that we might sing this new song. And so help us throughout this Advent season to sing this song wherever we are, to let our words and our deeds and our very lives announce that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the song that we sing. This is the prayer that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise to our feet and turn to hymn number 212 and sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. If you want to just uh, read the words from the screen, you may do that as well.
seated. We welcome you to church today, and we just pray that we continue having a great service for the Lord. And it's always great to, the first Sunday, we get out some of those Christmas carols and start singing them again. And uh, that's what we're here today, Adore Christ the Lord. I have some prayer requests to share with you this morning, um, and I will update you on some things, and, <clears throat> and we will pray for them. Finally, we just lift up more people who are um, dealing with cancer and disease and, and all of just all of the situations that come about because of that, and also our community, um, how we can reach out to our community. Um, you know, this is a beautiful valley here, and, and we, don't, we don't like to see houses get built on our beautiful valley, right? But one thing that means, what, one, thing, one thing that comes out of that is those houses are filled with people, okay? So, you know, as I'm coming down, um, uh, Dunker Valley Road this morning, um, I caught a glimpse of one of the new houses, and I'm like, oh, I never saw that house from that angle before, because, you know, now the leaves are down from trees, and you're starting to see things at different angles, and um, I think the, the, it's just important for us to remember there's a community around us that, that needs Jesus, and we can be um, light to that community. Earlier in this week, the property team was down here readjusting the lights on the steeple, um, it, the lights were kind of focusing on just the bottom of the steeple and not the, uh, the whole thing. So they, they put some time in to, to get that working um, more properly. And now the full steeple is lit up and it looks really nice. Um, and we have the slogan, light in the valley. So, so let's be the light in the valley to, to the people around us. So let's pray for our community um, and, uh, and maybe one time knock on the door of those new people and say, hey, we have a church right here that you can see from your house if you're interested. All right, with all of those things in mind, we are going to do our call to prayer, sing our call to prayer, uh, the first verse of number 211, Lo, how rose air blooming. Let's pray. Father God, we're reminded in that song that the rose that bloomed, your son, Jesus Christ, is out of the lineage of Jesse. And there's not many songs, I think, that we sing the word Jesse in it. But that lineage was so important. As we reflect on what you said would be true of the Messiah, of your son who would be born on this earth. And Lord, we thank you that your plan was perfect to bring that baby boy into this world to provide salvation for all those who would choose him. God, we rejoice in your goodness and your forethought and your foreknowledge of of all that would take place, all that's taking place now and all that's taking place before us and all that will take place long after we're gone. Lord, you knew that COVID-19 would come in the year 2020 and you know how much longer it will affect our lives. God, we, we lift to you the things that are on our minds, the burdens that are on our hearts, knowing that you can lift them, knowing that you're in control. God, we come to you today 
entering into this Advent season, celebrating the birth of your son, Jesus. And may we praise you because it was the start of him living his perfect life on earth that none of us could and dying in our place on the cross while showing us how to live. God, we lift up to you today things that are on our mind, and we give them to you because we're told to pray, but we also give them to you because we don't know what to do and we need your help. Lord, you are sovereign and holy, and these situations are in your control. For people around us that are experiencing cancer and other kinds of things going on, we just pray for healing. And God, for our community, we pray that we would be open to drawing people in. And not so that we could grow as a congregation, but so we could be your witnesses, be your light, reflect your light into this this literally dark valley, but metaphorically dark world. May we, may we shine that light into their lives, and may we be a source, a vessel used by you to bring the truth to people who need it. Give us ideas, Lord. Soften our hearts. May we reach out into this world. Thank you, Lord for reaching out into this world by sending your one and only son and guide us as we continue worshiping and adoring you this day. In your name we pray, amen. Please join in singing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 178 or on the screen. We praise God also, we didn't share this in the prayer time, but Tuesday night we had a, a great time moving a bunch of furniture out of a house, out of an old farmhouse that, um, that had a lot of rooms. It was very much an old farmhouse where you just kept finding another room after you went through another room, and we moved all that furniture to, uh, that's going to be in, used for a needy family. But that night started out... Um, as meeting at the church here on Tuesday night and Dwayne giving us addresses that we plugged into our GPSs. 
And so someone plugged the address into their GPS. I put it into mine on my, you know, on our phones. And and uh, and he said, "Oh wow, it's 21 minutes away." And I said, "Well, I don't know what's wrong with yours, but mine says 18 minutes away." And that's because there's multiple ways to get to many places, right? And so mine was taking the highway, and, and theirs was not taking the highway, and, and mine was showing that it would be a little bit quicker to go on the highway. You know, lots of times when I look at road signs, to me, they kind of show signs of simpler times. Like you have York Road. Well, where do you think York Road takes you to, you know? Or Carlisle Road. Um, I think about those times when people were naming the roads, and you named the road after the place it took you to lots of times. Maybe Godfrey Road, right? Takes you to the Godfreys. Maybe you know of a place that there's many ways to get to. I always joke that Hanover has like 30 ways to get there. None of them go straight. You know, it just seems like a, well, you know, Pastor Bob lives in Hanover, so he knows how, how weird it is to get to Hanover. They're all crooked roads, it seems like. And while today in 2020, I'm sure there's many roads that lead to Bethlehem, and I don't mean Bethlehem, PA, but Bethlehem in Israel, um, the context of this Advent series that we're doing is that there was one road to Bethlehem, a road that was designed perfectly by God in God's perfect plan to enter the world through his son, Jesus Christ, a perfect plan of redemption that God knew before he created the universe to save it, to save his creation, an unexpected, uh, beautiful path leading to a humble beginning for a perfect king. Let's pray. God, we thank you this day for your holy word. And as we get into the words that you shared through your prophet Micah and Isaiah, I just pray that these um, words would inspire us to live for you, inspire us to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and inspire us to live for him and grow in him. Guide me as I share these words. May I say what you want me to say and not say what you don't want me to say. In your name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to be jumping back and forth from Micah 5 to Isaiah 9. So have your Bibles ready as we jump back and forth. Isaiah, or sorry, Micah 5 and Isaiah 9. Uh, we're going to start out in Micah 5, verse 2. Micah 5, verse 2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are, among, are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Well, something I learned this week as I was getting these, uh, these scriptures ready to share with you today is that Micah and Isaiah actually prophesied in the same time period. Uh, Micah was primarily focusing on the southern kingdom, Judah, as he, as he prophesied. And his, the book of Micah is like filled with, as um, is called in one of my study Bibles, lots of judgment speeches. And these judgment speeches were designed to kind of jolt his audience into the recognition of their sin and to bring them to repentance. So much of Micah is helping Judah, Israel, to see the future judgment that would take place um, through captivity, this judgment from God. And verse 1 of Micah 5 shows that. He's telling them they need to prepare for the battle because it's coming. But verse 2, which what we're at right now, it starts talking about something much different, that there would be a ruler over Israel. And this was a good thing because this was something that they would desperately need. So some, some prophecy in verse 2 here that we're reading about this ruler is that first off, this ruler, this future ruler of Israel would be of the tribe of Judah, okay? So we know that there were 12 tribes, 12 sons of Jacob, who his name was turned, turned to Israel, and, and that fourth born, born, fourth, fourth born son of Jacob was Judah. So that is the tribe that this future ruler of Israel would come out of. The next thing is that it would, the child would be from the clan of Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Okay, I don't know if that's where Ephrata, Pennsylvania, got their name from, but Ephrathah, um, which was a small clan um, of the tribe of Judah. 
The Ephratha word, really, um, the reason the, the text has both Bethlehem and Ephratha there is because Ephratha was a former name for, for the word, for the town Bethlehem. Um, Bethlehem was five miles south of Jerusalem, and in the time that Micah wrote this, Bethlehem was populated by only a few hundred people. Um, and the town, Bethlehem was the town that King David was, was born in, if you might remember. That also then, about this ruler, is that, um, you know what, on, I'm going to be honest with you right here, I don't know what I mean by what I wrote here, okay? So I'm just going to read this quote from the, the Faith Life Study Bible um, about Bethlehem. I guess just that Bethlehem was small, but Bethlehem was located in the territory given to the tribe of Judah. However, it was not significant enough to be listed among the cities of Judah when the land was divided in the time of Joshua. So even though um, this says it was a small tribe, a small, you were small among the clans, other versions of the text say you weren't even like big enough to be considered a clan of Judah. The point is Bethlehem is tiny. Bethlehem is a humble place. Um, this ruler of Israel will be from this humble town that was too small to be considered a city. Uh, we know that this is a prophecy about Christ, that Christ would come out of Bethlehem. And it sounds really cool to us because we've really um, made it pretty, right? Like, oh, little town of Bethlehem. Like, it, it all sounds like really nice and pretty, and, and Bethlehem makes us think of Christmas and happy times. But for them to hear that a ruler would be coming out of Bethlehem was kind of like, really? Like, Bethlehem? Like, I don't know about that. For the Messiah? Um, but one more detail about this ruler is that this ruler had been around a long time. The text says that this ruler's origins are from old, from ancient times. So what could that mean? I mean, that was puzzling to them. Of course, again, we know the answer. Because Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. That's quoted in Revelation 22, 13. Also, John 1, 1 to 3 says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word, by the way, is Jesus. And the text tells us that in, in the contextual clues. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. That is talking about Jesus. Jesus was there in the beginning when God created the world, the universe. That's pretty ancient. That's as, that's as ancient as you can be, right? Um, Jesus said to the, the Pharisees when they were questioning him, he said, before Abraham existed, I am. <laughs> he was saying he was present then, he's present now, he, he's always present uh, Micah was cluing into his readers, and it was another prophecy that had, was fulfilled about Christ, that this ruler would be ancient. It's weird to think about Micah telling them, this person is coming in the future, but in the future, this person would have been ancient. Like, try to wrap your head around that, the idea of something in the future being old. That doesn't make much sense but it takes a supernatural situation for that to be true. In other words, this ruler was going to be more than human. You can't get more ancient or more older than the origin of God. And we can't really fathom God's origin because there is not an origin. He was just there. <laughs> it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. Verse 2 has one more huge detail about this whole thing. Notice in verse 2 that it says, Out of Bethlehem will come for, you, for me one who will be ruler of Israel. This whole thing was for God. This whole thing, this ruler coming out of Bethlehem, Ephrathah, was for advancing God's divine plan. This ruler would come out for him. So that takes us to verse 3. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. 
So after Micah tells them about this future ruler, it kind of gets back to the bad news, telling the Israelites that they're going to be abandoned. And that Hebrew word abandoned means that God would give them up. I mean, it's a sad idea to think that God would just give up his people. No one wants to be given up by anyone, right? No one would want to really be abandoned. That's not a desire of ours. But God is a just God, and God is a holy God. And God's people strayed far from him. And God would give them up into captivity and judgment. The Reformation Study Bible says that because of this, Israel was without a Davidic king from the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. until the coming of Christ. You know, often we don't like to paint God this way. We don't, we don't want God to be seen as this uh, just or or God of, of wrath, but these are true attributes of God. God's wrath helps us to see how wonderful and amazing his love and grace is. So the bad times build up and they build up until the right time that God saw fit for captivity to take place. Until the right time God saw fit for Jesus to be born. And so the road to Bethlehem would be paved the one perfect way that God planned. Now, perhaps in this text, when it says that she who is in labor gives birth, perhaps that's referring to Mary. Perhaps that's referring to Israel being ripe for the harvest or the right time for birth. And things would be better once again. So we're going to be moving into Isaiah now, going back and forth with this situation in mind. So we're looking at Isaiah 9, 2 to 3. All right, thinking about the fact that things were building, the bad things were continually building. So Isaiah 9, 2 to 3 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. Isaiah, as well as Micah, knew through the providence of God that there were going to be some dark times ahead. These abandoned times that the people would be given up would be dark, dark times. Isaiah says at verse 8 before this, uh, at the end of chapter 8, that this, this would be utter darkness. Walking in the dark is a real good way to get hurt, right? Uh, for the past for the past five years or so, I've taken these hikes on the Appalachian Trail. And usually the group that I go with, um, the guy that does it, he's trying to hike the whole Appalachian Trail, but he's doing it in pieces. So I go with him and his crew, and they start out on Friday night. We usually don't start hiking until about 8 or 9 o'clock, and we hike till like 11 or midnight in the woods, okay? So it's dark, obviously. We use headlamps, and and uh, every, every night when I go to sleep, all I see is the trail blazes because I'm very much looking for those blazes to make sure I stay on the Appalachian Trail as I'm walking around at dark, okay? But when we get to the campsite or wherever we're going to lay our heads down for the night, it's always really weird because we're setting up in the dark and trying to get everything situated. And the one year, by the way, we started getting attacked by bees at like 1130 at night, and that was horrible. Um, but you set up and you kind of, in your mind, you have it all figured out what your surroundings are. But as you sleep and as the daylight comes, you start looking around and you're like, oh, okay, there's a rock there, there's some trees there. And like you start seeing more and more of what's around you. And it's amazing to me the difference of what things look like in the dark and at nighttime compared to what they look like in the day. It's so much easier to function with God's light instead of just this little headlamp. God's light is always the best light. When we're living in darkness, or when we're in literal darkness, a little tiny light shines bright, right? Like a little tiny light in a very dark room will shine extremely bright. But darkness can't put out that light. Isaiah says that after all this abandonment, after all these dark times, light would be coming. How wonderful to hear that for people who were, as the text says, living in the valley of the shadow of death. Such relief for light to come on the people in those times, in those days. 
for Israel this day would be coming. The shadow of death, probably referring to Assyria's impending shadow, um, would eventually dissipate. And this all was caused by the spiritual darkness that they were living in. They desperately needed the light as they were living in the darkness of sin. This is darkness that's hard for us to really fathom. Matthew 6, 23, what Jesus says when referring to living in sin, he says, how great is that darkness? Isaiah shows that light would be coming, and the messianic prophecies give, gave the people hope. What's awesome about thinking about Jesus, about the light, is as we look further in John chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, referring to Jesus as the light, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Revelation 21, 23, we've talked about this before, talks about the fact that Jesus is the source of light in heaven. It says this city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb, that's referring to Christ, is its lamp. Isaiah 60, 19 says, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. What a light for people that desperately needed it, better than LED lights at Christmas time. Physical light or spiritual light or illuminating light, all of those things are good. And God's light is good. This dawning light, which that's beautiful imagery, thinking about the sun coming up on darkness. This dawning light would enlarge, in, enlarge the nation, okay? Um, and of course, again, just a reminder that this light is Christ. So Christ would enlarge the nation through Christ. Gentiles would be added to the Jewish faith. Um, anyone who believes, Galatians 3.29 says that anyone who believes becomes um, the seed of Abraham and heirs to Abraham according to the promise. This light would increase their joy. And how could he not? This is the savior of all the people. I mean, the more the merrier. They say the love is in the house when the house is packed, right? This is a permanent way to end the curse of sin through Jesus. Finally, this dawning light would cause rejoicing, which is an outward expression of that joy. And we are doing that this morning, worshiping the Lord, praising him in the gladness of our hearts for what he's done. For an abandoned people living in darkness, how would this road to Bethlehem look? How could they expect to meet this Savior? And that's answered in Isaiah 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." all from a tiny baby boy, a weak little baby? How, how could a baby be a ruler? A baby can't do anything but eat, cry, and poop. That's what babies do, right? But a baby boy would be born, the, the scriptures say. And babies are so tiny. In that video at the beginning of the service, there's the baby reaching up and someone, like an adult, putting their finger there. And I, I love, that's one of my favorite things to do with babies because I, I don't like to do much with little babies because I'm afraid I'll break them. They're just... Once they can hold their neck up, that's when, I, that's when I like hanging out with them a little more. But you stick your pinky out and they wrap their hand around it. That's just a cool thing. But it's a reminder of how tiny and how weak and, and pathetic a little baby can be. Like a king? Like how is that possible? Uh, Isaiah said more about um, who would have that baby in Isaiah 7.14 that therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. There's a tiny little baby on this road to Bethlehem. And that baby, here's, here's seven quick things about that baby, what would be true about it. First, the baby would be born to us um, in the context of this scripture, born to the Israelites, all right? God's chosen people, God's nation. Uh, Jesus even said that he came for the Jews. But the master plan was to bring them to God uh, bring the Jews to God, and then open it up for all the Gentiles, people like us, to know the truth. Secondly, it would be a given 
son. This baby would be male, and this baby would be a gift. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says that we're saved by grace through faith. This is a gift of God. The next thing it says is that the government would be on the shoulders of this baby. In other words, the baby would be a king or a ruler. Just like Micah said, there would be a ruler over Israel. This baby's rule would be supreme. All governing would come through him. And then the baby um, would be called, would have uh, human and divine qualities, and it would be a human and divine savior. So then this uh, next slide is going to show you a picture of a weird-looking dude. Um, that's that's uh, Handel, the guy who wrote the um, Messiah that everybody sings, you know. Wonderful counselor, almighty God. So that's why I put that in there, okay. So this baby would be called a wonderful counselor, all right. Um, marvelous and miraculous advisor. You know, there's no one better uh, for a counselor with divine wisdom. This baby would be called Mighty God. And we know that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful above all else. We know uh, that this baby then would be called Everlasting Father. I mean, everlasting means forever, right? Uh, no need for a successor after this king. This king would be the end of all kings. And then after that, he'd be called Prince of Peace. And Jesus gives us peace on the outside and on the inside, in how we deal with others, in what's going on with ourselves, and how we deal with God, in the fact that our sins will be paid, we have peace. These are incredible words and phrases to offer a holy God a, a, to a humble Savior. These words are not words that would be given to just a human king, especially when it says mighty God, uh, that clearly sets apart this baby from other kings. But now we're going to have to go back to Micah and see what else Micah said about this ruler from Bethlehem. Micah 5, verses 4 and 5 says that he would stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of his Lord, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. This says that he would be a shepherd caring for the flock. Isn't it amazing then that Jesus said in John 10, 14 to 16, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Of course, Jesus is referencing the Jews and then later the Gentiles. And there's plenty of other Bible texts that refer to Jesus as being the shepherd. A shepherd is dedicated, sacrificing his life for the sheep. The people is the flock who needs his guidance. It's quite an analogy for us to understand. And this is all done by the Lord's strength and also by the majesty of of his name. His name is wonderful. It's incredible, and that's why it's such an offense to God when we use his name in vain, because his name is sacred and holy. This road to Bethlehem would, would kickstart the reign of Christ on the earth and his eventual eternal reign and would make God's name even greater. And the flock under the care of the ruler, the light, the shepherd, the flock lives securely. Would anyone in this room like a little bit of security in the year of 2020? This greatness would spread. This security would go to the ends of the earth. And it's familiar to hear about this greatness of the Lord reaching the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8, um, the, the apostles are told to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And this peace would be there for those who would accept it. What a quality life this ruler could provide. 
But Isaiah will say, when we back to Isaiah again, says a little bit more about how this ruler will reign. Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So this baby, this future ruler's reign, will, his rule will never end. It will only grow, um, and it will come from David's throne. And there's two lineages, in one in Matthew, one in Luke, that go through Mary and Joseph's um, family lines that show, both of them, that they go through David. And that's significant for two reasons. One is that 2 Samuel 7, 16 Um, God promises to David that your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. That's one thing that's significant about that, but, but it's also significant then because Christ fulfills this and is the king forever through his death and resurrection on the cross. It's pretty awesome. It's not bad for a tiny little baby. And then his peace will never end. His peace will just grow and grow We recognize Christ sharing peace with messages like love your enemy as as yourselves. And in seeing and knowing that forgiveness is there for me and we can extend forgiveness then to others. Forgiveness exists for all of us and we extend that forgiveness to others. Knowing we get peace as well, knowing that our wretched hearts, we know how wicked, each of us in here right now knows how wicked our hearts are. These wretched hearts um, don't get the punishment that we deserve and we have peace through our faith in Christ and what he has done on the cross. We have our righteousness through him. That brings us peace indeed, peace like no other. Hezekiah was one of the kings at the time of Isaiah and Micah. They didn't say that one of his kids would be able to do what's described here. You know, this was going to happen and be a done deal, all from a tiny little baby on a road to Bethlehem. And how would it be accomplished? Would it be done through human tricks or deception or God using humans to make it happen? No, Isaiah 9, 7 says that the zeal or the passion and strong desire and love for his chosen, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. The Reformation Bible study says, study Bible says, God guarantees that he himself will fulfill this promise. It will not depend on human power. Or decisions. In other words, God is sovereign and His ways are going to happen no matter what. We can't do anything to stop what God has planned to happen. And you know what's even more comforting than that, or what is more comforting than that, is that we can't do anything to mess up God's perfect plan either. Isaiah and Micah offer hope to the people that's fulfilled in a baby, in a manger. And maybe, you know, doubt has crept up on you sometime in your life that you're like, I don't know. Was Jesus really the Messiah? I mean, this is a bunch of coincidences. Like, I don't know. So I I want to ask you the question. uh, Satan likes to raise doubt in our minds, I think. Um, I want to ask you the question, what are the chances, you know? Think, and, and as you're considering what are the chances that this would happen, I want you to think about the following things. That of all the people in the world, okay, Mary would be engaged or pledged to be married to Joseph, all right? Of all the people in the world, those are the two that got together. Then, of all the women in the world, Mary is the one who became pregnant through the Holy Spirit, all right? Then, Joseph, through a vision from God, stayed with her, okay? They stay together, even though she's suddenly pregnant, um, and it wasn't by him, and he knew that. Then of all of the empires in the world, Rome is the empire that's in charge of this situation right now, okay? And out of all the people that could have been in charge of Rome, Caesar Augustus was the one who was ruling. And it just so happens that in that very time period when Mary is pregnant, Caesar Augustus wants a census to take place to find out how many people are living in his kingdom It just so happens that that census takes place at the exact time that Mary is pregnant 
with baby Jesus. And of all the tribes that Joseph and Mary could have been a part of, they're in the tribe of Judah. And of all the clans that Joseph would have belonged to, it was the clan of David, Bethlehem. So Bethlehem was where they had to travel. And remember, that's where it was prophesied about. Baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem, just as it was foretold. Joseph and Mary's lineages both trace to David, just as was prophesied that it would come out of David and that the kingdom would be through David forever. All you can say to that is that it was God's plan. This journey to Bethlehem was calculated by God and figured out before God created the universe. God knew what his plan to save us would be, and this road to Bethlehem brought the divine human into the world for you and for me. This baby would become king forever, just as God promised David. So I have two questions for us as we apply our word today. The first question is, are you living in the light? Just as it's much easier to literally walk in the light, the same is true uh, spiritually. The book of Psalms tells us that God's word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Just in the same way as we fumble around and look for a light switch immediately when we walk into a dark room, especially when we're arriving to our house at nighttime, in that same way, we need to have the desire to live in the light of Christ. Let scripture illuminate us. Let God's un infallible, unchanging word reign in our hearts. May we shine Christ's light and live in his light, which will show us where it is safe to step. A tiny, as I said earlier, a tiny little bit of light in a dark room is really bright, and as John 1 says, darkness cannot overcome the light. And Christ is your light, so let him shine. The second question I have for you is, do you have peace? You may have heard the expression or phrase before, no Christ, no peace. That's N-O Christ, N-O peace. And then you change it to K-N-O-W, no Christ, no peace. There's no end to his peace, you know. Thanksgiving might have been a really weird time for you, maybe. Maybe Christmas is going to be really weird too, depending on where you go or who you don't see or whatever. You know, there's people walking around with masks everywhere, right? I mean, we're used to it now, but at first it was kind of like, this is like the twilight zone, right? Uh, COVID, you get COVID-19 alerts on your phone. We're living in a weird time. Like, it's a really weird time when you think about it. But I guarantee you, when you're living in Christ, you're going to have peace no matter what thing you're going through. Troubles are going to come, and Christ has overcome those troubles. And there's no guarantee that living as Christ followers is going to give us a perfect life. But through him, we have the ability to apply that peace and endure through Christ. So ease your troubled mind and ease your fears and ease your impatience for getting back to life as normal. The road to Bethlehem was the first time that earthly eyes started to see God's perfect plan for peace. And peace is ours through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that started in a cattle trough. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the road to Bethlehem and, and the fact that your holy scriptures contain for us what took place that proved that this baby boy was your son, that this baby boy was your Messiah and was the chosen one, the one who would fulfill the prophecies, the one who would live the life we couldn't and would die in our place. We thank you, Lord, for that perfect plan. As we continue to celebrate in Advent, Lord, may, may we be further encouraged by the fact that Jesus is the Messiah and that he reigned on this earth and that he gave up his life for all of us this day. In your name we pray, amen. Hope is something we desperately want, right, in these crazy times. And hope certainly was provided through Jesus' birth. So let's sing number 189, To Us a Child of Hope 
is born. Please stand as you sing, and I'll be down front if you want prayer for anything going on in your lives or want to know more about knowing Jesus as your Savior. Go in peace, knowing that peace is yours, and knowing, too, that the light is shining through Jesus. Amen.